Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are talking about the endocrine system, diabetes, thyroid, and OB, and this is part one. First, in the discussion of diabetes, we need to discuss insulin. Insulin is a hormone, a peptide synthesized in pancreatic beta cells. Insulin helps in the transport of glucose into cells, and the electrolyte that moves along with glucose is potassium, also moves from the serum into the cells. Insulin is a storage hormone, so it shifts your metabolism towards storage. That would mean synthesis of glycogen and lipids, and it also stimulates protein synthesis, so that it is an anabolic hormone. Insulin is metabolized quickly in the kidneys and the liver with a half time of about 5 to 10 minutes. Even though it's quickly metabolized, it does have a sustained effect for about 30 to 60 minutes because insulin binds very tightly to its receptors. In the body, insulin is normally secreted at the rate of about one unit per hour, although this rate goes up quite a bit in response to stimuli inc including food, stress, admi administration of corticosteroids, and other stimuli. Alpha adrenergic stimulation tends to decrease insulin levels, while beta stimulation and parasympathetic stimulation, that would be the rest and digest stimulation, those increase insulin levels. It's important for us to realize that insulin receptors get saturated at relatively low insulin concentrations. And so you may have seen some of your instructors giving boluses of 5 or 10 or even 15 or 20 units of IV insulin but there really isn't good data that this is an effective practice. And if you observe your patients, you may see that running an infusion at a low rate of only one to two units per hour may actually be more effective than giving a large IV bolus. But one advantage of large boluses is it does take longer to metabolize and clear them, so you do get a greater net effect. When patients are treated with insulin, the number one biggest risk is hypoglycemia, which is obvious. But we need to appreciate that hypoglycemia carries with it quite a bit of complications in morbidity. So it's recommended to not be too aggressive in treating hyperglycemia with insulin. Usually a target blood glucose of less than 180 is appropriate for patients in the operating room and the critical care setting. Some of our patients develop insulin resistance, which means you need more insulin given in order to achieve a certain effect. In patients who are taking insulin at home, we usually recommend that on the day of surgery, they should take no short-acting insulin and only a partial dose, perhaps a third to a half dose, of their long-acting insulin. Patients who have implanted uh, insulin pumps may continue continue them on a regular continuous infusion that does not adjust with the time of day, or they can discontinue the pump. Intraoperatively, we often have to give insulin in response to hyperglycemia. And I personally think that a sliding scale is always the best way to manage hyperglycemia and use some sort of a protocol, which we will take a look at in just a moment. In general, one unit of regular insulin will lower the plasma glucose by about 25 to 30 milligrams per deciliter in a normal adult. But again, we have patients who have insulin resistance and they may need much higher doses. The onset of insulin's action when given IV is about 10 minutes with a peak activity in 15 to 30 minutes. And as we said before, the clinical duration of the drug is usually 30 to 60 minutes. When I run an insulin infusion, you can start it at a rate of 0.1 units per kilogram per hour, or you can start by taking their current plasma glucose and dividing it by 150 and using that as your initial infusion rate in units per hour. And remember that insulin binds to plastic, and so it's recommended that when you have your insulin infusion and you spike it, that you waste about 10 to 20 cc's through the tubing to bind up all of those plastic binding sites. Now, as I said before, it's best if you can use an insulin sliding scale that's published, that has published guidelines. 
This is one example of many different kinds of insulin sliding scales. In this scale, you see we have an initiation section, which looks at the patient's starting blood glucose. And depending on what their blood glucose is, it recommends a certain bolus to be given IV, and then the rate at which the IV infusion should be started. Then there's a titration section, and every hour the blood glucose should be checked. And then the two inputs to this chart are what the new blood glucose is, as well as how much it's changed. Has it decreased by at least 30 milligrams per deciliter, which is a large decrease, or if it's decreased by less than 30 milligrams per deciliter, or it's increased. So we have a smaller decrease, which means the patient could probably tolerate a more substantial adjustment in their insulin treatment. And so once we have those two variables, we have options including stopping the insulin, decreasing or increasing the rate, or giving a bolus. There are several different kinds of insulin. Most of the time you will be giving regular insulin, which, as we said, already has um, an onset, and this is for subcutaneous administration. So this is how insulin is all, often given on the floors, sometimes in the ICU, and certainly when patients are administering at home, they give it subcutaneously. In those cases, you'll see regular insulin has a slower onset of about 30 to 60 minutes, a peak of two to three hours, and a duration of six to eight hours but there are also shorter and longer acting insulins. And the longest acting is called Lantus, which is glargine insulin. It has an onset of about one and a half hours, but it has no peak. It maintains a constant level of insulin for about 30 hours. And this is a great drug for patients who need a certain basal insulin rate. One other point that we note is that the NPH insulin, the P stands for protamine, and patients can have allergy to protamine. So we need to be careful in patients who have protamine allergy that we would not want to give them NPH insulin and vice versa. Now glucagon is another hormone that we'll discuss, and glucagon is really the anti-insulin. We said insulin is secreted from pancreatic beta cells, and glucagon is secreted from pancreatic alpha cells. Glucagon is secreted in response to hypoglycemia, stress, trauma, cortisol, and sepsis. Glucagon does the opposite of insulin, so it causes mobilization of glucose and fatty acids and amino acids from their storage into the systemic circulation. It also increases liver production of glucose, or gluconeogenesis. Glucagon is not a catecholamine, but it has catecholamine-like effects. It acts directly on the cells to increase cyclic AMP, which is just what catecholamines do through their catecholamine receptors. And therefore, if you give glucagon IV, you can increase myocardial contractility, stroke volume, and heart rate. And interestingly, even if a patient is beta-blocked or has had a beta-blockade overdose, Glucagon will still work like epinephrine or a beta agonist to increase heart rate and contractility. So glucagon would be a treatment for patients who have beta blockade toxicity. Glucagon also increases the secretion of bile, and you may be asked to give glucagon IV during an ERCP procedure, and usually the dose is 1 to 2 milligrams IV. Side effects of glucagon include nausea and vomiting and hyperglycemia, and it's also a short-acting hormone with a half-time of three to six minutes. Now switching gears, we're going to talk about some oral agents that are commonly used in patients who have diabetes. The first agents that we'll discuss, and one of the first-line treatments that's started in patients who have diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, are the, are the sulfonylurea drugs. These include glipizide, gliburide, and glimepiride, and these drugs all increase the activity of the beta cells. So you can see they're not going to work very well in patients who have type 1 diabetes. Those patients don't have any pancreatic beta cells. But type 2 diabetes, those patients may benefit from increasing beta cell activity, which will lead to more insulin secretion. Not surprisingly, the side effect of this drug would be hypoglycemia.
And like I said, this drug is often a first-line treatment for type 2 diabetics, but over time, especially if they don't change their diet and their weight and other risk factors, they may no longer have an adequate response to this single drug, the single sulfonuria drugs, at which point a second drug would need to be added. These drugs are metabolized in the liver. The next set of oral drugs is called the biguanides, and metformin or glucophage is the most commonly given one nowadays. These drugs don't lower your blood sugar. Instead, they inhibit hepatic gluconeogenesis. Normally, your liver takes lactate and converts it into glucose, and metformin blocks that. So instead of lowering blood sugar, it prevents the synthesis of glucose. Theoretically, if you block this reaction, you may have an increased level of lactate and cause lactic acidosis. And classically, it was always recommended to hold metformin on the day of surgery. It's not really clear there's any evidence for this, and probably metformin does not carry as much risk for lactic acidosis as some of the older biguanides did. Really, hypoglycemia is not a concern with this drug. So looking back, the sulfonurias you may want to stop in patients who are NPO so they don't become hypoglycemic, but that won't really be an issue in patients who are taking metformin. Just to talk about a few other commonly used diabetic agents, the TZDs, let's see if I can pronounce it, the thiazolidinediones, one day I'll learn to pronounce that correctly. So these drugs are most commonly typified by pioglitazone, which is actose. These drugs decrease insulin resistance at the skeletal muscle level and in adipose tissue. So they're great drugs for our type 2 diabetic patients. It makes the body more sensitive to insulin. We also have a class of drugs called the DDP4 inhibitors. These are drugs like Genuvia, Anglyza, and Trigenta. These drugs inhibit a substance called DPP4, and they increase insulin release and decrease hepatic glucose production. In general, we do ask patients to stop all of these drugs on the day of surgery. But some discretion is appropriate, and often, if there's not going to be a significant interruption in their caloric intake, let's say it's a short outpatient procedure, especially if it's earlier in the day, it may be appropriate for them to just continue all of their normal oral diabetic agents. We'll stop the recording here. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you again in the next video.